um, I'd like to give the opening prayer then I'll introduce our speaker for tonight alright let's have a word of prayer our loving sweet Jesus Lord we thank you so much for being so good to us thank you Lord for setting a good example by coming down to this earth for dying for us on the cross Lord as you're gonna study about the life of a missionary Lord many of us have never experienced this but through this testimony of brother Tino we are able to understand what this life is all about Lord I pray that you give us and help us to learn the experiences that brother Tino has, ex uh, has experienced and Lord I pray that we can be a great example to others as well Lord we thank you so much for this wonderful time we can come together as, as friends different part of the world Lord we are united as one we thank you so much for this platform of Zoom Lord I pray that all of us have a good internet uh, connection so we are able to listen to the word that you have prepared for us Lord we thank you so much for everything we pray in Jesus name Amen all right, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening Brother Tino is very close to my heart all right, he was the first international students all right pastor robert and i you know met when we first went to the college right cpac we were, uh, we were looking for international students say how come there's no international students and um, then the first person we met was tino you know tino and he was so warm you know he really um, gave us a warm uh, introduction and able to guide us throughout the uh, the college right there so and uh, he was very close we do things together we always go to cafeteria together you know even though we have different classes he's an engineer and we are all pastors and uh, we always you know find time and uh, go for lunch and dinner together you know and uh, we sing songs and we praise god together he was the president of our he was the first president of our international association in uh, cpac now i'd like to go to his um, real introduction okay tino is a civil engineer who is currently working for the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, also known as ADRA. ADRA is the human, humanitarian arm, arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In his role as a technical advisor for water, sanitation and hygiene, referred to as WASH, W-A-S-H, WASH. Tino is involved in the design and implementation of WASH projects in multiple countries basically Tino uses his engineering background to ensure that the assistance that ADRA gives to people in need gives safe water and access uh, safe water and access to toilets since COVID has broke out last year Tino moved back to his home country Zimbabwe and has been working remotely from his bedroom turn office so I'd like to welcome brother Tino to share to us his experience. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, no, I'm really excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> and it's it's so good to see you guys. Uh, most of you for perhaps the second or third time. Um, some of you for the first time. But I'm just really excited. And um, I hope that um, I can share something that will um, that will make us understand our true role as Christians a little better. Um, yeah, so I'll start. So when when Robert asked me to let me just put up my share my presentation. Um, when Robert asked me to speak, sorry, Pastor Robert asked me to share um, a few. I think it was two weeks ago. And he shared the idea that he had for this amazing program that he was coming up with. And I thought it was a great idea. Uh, my first instinct was to say no. Um, and I remember telling him, uh, dude, I, I don't even consider myself a missionary, at least not in the way the word is commonly used. Um, just because I realized that um, there are people who are making much bigger sacrifices, uh, who are giving up so many more comforts. Um, living in conditions that a lot of us, myself included, I'm not even sure I would even be able to endure. So I, I know I'm just not that. And I was looking at 
uh, the other names that he has of the other people who are supposed to speak and thinking to myself, well, no, these are real missionaries. I mean, I, I consider myself just really lucky. I'm in a job that I, I'm in love with. I get to use my professional skills as, uh, as an engineer. I receive a salary um, and I still get to be of service to, to God and to others. But then the more I started thinking about it, the more I started feeling like, you know what, but isn't that the way it should be anyway? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be the dream for every Christian um, to be able to use, to find ways to use the skills that God gave you or to find ways to use your career and your profession, whatever it is, uh, teacher, doctor, um, nurse, uh, accountant, uh, pharmacist, to use whatever God has given us, whatever opportunity that God has given us, to find ways to use that to the service of God. And so I decided, you know what, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. So I was like, you know what, I, I will not refuse. I'll, I'll take this up. And, and that's and partly because I'm just very fond of um, uh, of Robert. And, and so I just decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Uh, but then the more I started thinking about it over these past few days, the more I started um, realizing how this is something that um, needs to be in our minds a lot more as, Christ as Christians. Now, I believe that we as Christians are called to be missionaries. Whatever our day job is, we are called to provide um, ministries of service, to promote our faith, to go out on a religious mission sent by God. And it doesn't have to be in a far off country. Uh, because a lot of the need anyway is around us, but we're all called to be missionaries in some capacity. And I think as Christians, it, 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 it is our responsibility to use the skills that, um, that we have, to use our jobs, whatever job it is, to serve God and become a missionary in whatever place you find yourself in. And if you don't agree with me, I want to challenge you to throughout this these next few minutes i want to challenge you to rethink your definition of what it means to be a christian john chapter 13 verse 35 says by this and anna thank um jeremy thanks for that song um, um it just fits in so well with what i'm going to be talking about today it's it's as if god I mean, God doesn't make mistakes. It's, it's as if God knew that all of this was going to come in together. Um, John chapter 13, verse 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. I love that verse so much. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And just to give a little background. So Jesus is about to go back to heaven. So th these are some of the last few moments that he has with his disciples. So picture this as one, picture this like, like a father who's about to send off his, um, send off his son maybe to, to school or to college. And he sits down with his son to give his final last words of wisdom, pieces of advice. Or a mother who's about to uh, go on a long journey and she calls her children to give them some final parting words. Or um, an old man who's on his deathbed and he calls in his grandchildren and all his children to sort of give them some parting words. It, it, this, this is, it's, it's something of that nature. And so he calls his disciples and he decides to give them some words about how the world is supposed to know or how the world is going to get to know that these guys, the apostles, are the true followers of this guy, Jesus, who once lived and now he's dead. And so he says to his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And I find it interesting that Jesus decided to make this about love. Um, I mean, he could have talked about anything. He could have gotten into a conversation about theology and fundamental beliefs and which was more important, perhaps even singled out, you know, what he thought was the greatest fundamental belief and said something like, by this fundamental belief shall all people know that you guys are my disciples. This is the distinctive mark. He could have even told them to start referring to themselves as Christians. He could have said, all right, call yourself Christians. And by this name, Christian, 
shall all the world know that you are my disciples. But we all know that the name Christian comes much later in the book of Acts. He didn't even talk about Sabbath keeping. And don't get me wrong, you and I know that Sabbath keeping is one of the identifying marks of God's church in these last days. But Jesus didn't make it about Sabbath keeping because all of that can be faked. You can fake Sabbath keeping. You can fake returning time. You can fake going to church on Sabbath. Um, all of that can be faked. Uh, the Pharisees and, 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 and the Sadducees were Sabbath keepers. I'm not sure they had love. And so Jesus realizes that something more is needed as a differentiator between those who are God's true disciples and those who are not. And so he decides to say, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by love. And I think these words still ring true today. Just one more thing. So, so when Ellen White comments on, on this verse, on John chapter 13, verse 35, she talks about how love is the evidence of discipleship. She talks about how when God's church, when God's people love each other, when, when there's this oneness and, and there's this spirit of service and people are, are giving each other, you know, kind, um, are, are going about in, in kind deeds one to another. She talks about how it makes the devil angry. He gets really mad. I think the words that she uses, it, it, it stirs up the wrath of Satan. He hates it. He hates to see a, a church that loves each other, a church that loves the world in which it lives. The devil hates it when the church goes about uh, delivering acts of service just because it's this kind of love that demonstrates who God is, is this kind of love that shows God's face on earth. So I, I want to challenge you that it doesn't matter how many fancy churches you have. Um, it, it's just not going to do the trick. It, it, we are called to do more than just build fancy churches. That's not what's going to attract people to us. It's, it's not about our name, Seventh-day Adventist. It's, it's, it's not about, it doesn't matter how many copies of the Desire of Ages and the great controversy we, we distribute and leave in waiting rooms all over the world. That's not going to do it. Uh, uh, First Corinthians chapter 13 says all of that without love is, is just like a sounding symbol. What we're not doing anything. It's, it's going to be for naught. Ter Teresa of Avila says, Christ has no body now, but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body on this earth, but yours. There are certain books that make a big impact on, on our lives, you know, certain books that you read and you learn something that's just really amazing that sticks with you for years to come. For me, this such a book or one of the books is a book entitled The Hole in Our Gospel. And I think I read this book, if not in college, then maybe a little while after college. Um, and the, the writer of this book, Richard Stearns, argues that... Um, if we look at the life of Jesus, he came to deliver the gospel, but the gospel has two sides. It's got, it's the good news. It's got the good news of salvation. And he also performed acts of service. And throughout Jesus' ministry, we find out that the gospel was more than just preaching. It was more than just uh, talking about salvation. It had to do with healing the sick. It had to do with attending to the needs of the, uh, of the less fortunate. And Richard Stearns argues that if we are to follow the example that Jesus set when he was on earth, um, we need to um, mirror um, the example of preaching the two sides of the gospel. We need to learn from Jesus' example that life on earth is more than just preaching salvation. It has to do with acts of service. And by his life here on earth, Christ challenged us to love our neighbors and our enemies. He challenged us to forgive those who wronged us. He challenged us to um, lift up 
um, those who are poor, those who are downtrodden. He challenged us to share what we have with those who are in need. He challenged us to live lives of sacrifice. And if we're not doing all of the all of the, these things, if we're not combining all of these things with our gospel, then what we are preaching is a gospel with holes in it. We are preaching part of the gospel and we're leaving some of it out. Um, there's, there's, there's John 3 verse 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so Richard Stern says, if God loved the world so much that he left heaven and all of the splendor and glory of heaven to suffer on earth here with us, then maybe we as Christians have a responsibility to love the people that God loved, the people that God sacrificed so much for. If we are real disciples of Christ, then maybe we have a responsibility to love the people that he loves so much. Uh, Richard Pierce, who is the founder of a Christian charity known as World Vision, says he had a famous prayer, which is now famous, he's late, in which he used to pray, Lord, let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart. If we are to be true Christians, then we need to start having compassion and our hearts need to start getting moved by the things that move God's heart. And if we look at Jesus' exa example here on earth, we see exactly um, the kinds of things that broke his heart. And I think those are the same things that would break his heart today. Poverty, I believe, is something that breaks God's heart. The fact that all of us here, I presume, had a good lunch um, or a breakfast, and if you didn't have breakfast like, like myself, it's because you decided not to. And yet there are so many other people who did not eat because they don't have food. I believe that breaks God's heart. Um, the fact that there are people in other parts of the world that have to walk kilometers every day to fetch water or not even find that water, end up, end up using water from um, really polluted sources. I believe that breaks God. That's something that breaks God's heart. Or the fact that, you know, the images that we've been seeing these uh, last few weeks coming out of Afghanistan and um, women and, and, and families holding on to uh, a U.S. military jet as it's trying to fly out from Kabul because they are so scared of what their life is going to look like when the new regime takes place. I believe that breaks God's heart or the image of the father um, holding up the baby to a complete stranger, a soldier, with the belief that the life of that little baby is going to be so much better um, with a total stranger. And that kid is going to have a better shot at life if he lets her go. I, I believe that's something that breaks God's heart or the fact that there are people dying of diseases that are easily preventable. Diseases that in most parts of the world or in, um, in most classes of society, we, we don't even think about them anymore. They are, they are not a problem anymore. Diseases like diarrhea, Nobody has to die from diarrhea. We, we, we solved that long ago. And yet millions of people today die of diseases like diarrhea, diseases like malaria. Uh, I believe that that's something that breaks God's heart. And so this whole book talks about how Christianity is more than just having a personal relationship with God. It involves an outward and transforming relationship with the world. I underlined the word transforming. And so it's not enough to just believe. It's not enough to just go to church. It's not enough to worship and preach and sing. It's not enough to have a personal morality. It's not enough to even have Christian community and live within this bubble of Christianity where we meet every week, comfort ourselves um, without reaching out to a world that's in need, without making an effort to find out about the needs of those around us. Unless our hearts start getting broken by the things that break God's heart, then we are preaching a gospel that's got a hole in it. What else breaks God's heart? Inequality breaks God's heart. Um, 
um, for Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse thirteen, and um, I pasted it here from the New Living Translation. Um, as a little background, Paul is talking to the church um, in Corinth, obviously, the book of Corinthians. And he is, the church in Corinthians apparently was really rich. Um, and he was writing this verse I just read this morning to the church. He was encouraging the church in Corinth to support the poorer church in, um, in Jerusalem. Apparently the church in Jerusalem was suffering. The Christians there were not having it really well. And the church in Corinth was really well off. And, and this is what um, Paul says. And this verse is for those who have never stopped to, um, to think that the Bible has something to say about inequality. Of course, Paul says, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you are in need. In this way, things will be equal. As the scripture says, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Um, we see here how God cares about issues of equality. And going back even to the Old Testament, um, there was a practice, and my dad explained to this, I've, I've heard him talk about this a while back in, in, in relation to the story of Ruth, and it's there was some law about how every time uh, if you had a piece of land and you were farming and when harvest time came, uh, God told his people not to harvest um, all of the field. He would tell them when you harvest your field, if you are rich and you have this piece of land, when it's harvest time, just harvest in the middle, but leave some of the crops that are at the size. Just leave them there so that the poor can come and uh, maybe they'll also get um, their sustenance from what you leave behind. Meaning that um, he cared about how God cares about how those who are well off use their resources um, in the face of a, a world that's in need or in the face of inequality. And um, we all know the story of Ruth and how Ruth gleaned wheat from Boaz's land. And that, that had to do with uh, justice and, and equality. It's, it's not just something that we're hearing a lot of in 2021. Now, I know what you're thinking. A lot of you are thinking, well, inequality, this has got nothing to do with me. Uh, when we hear inequality nowadays, I know exactly what you're thinking. You're talking, this guy is talking about the super rich. Tino is talking about the, the multimillionaires, the, and well, I'm, I'm not one of them. This, this has got nothing to do with me. I'm not a millionaire. I'm not in the 1%. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm no Jeff, Jeff Bezos. I'm, I'm not the one in a, in a space race uh, with, with, with Branson. I'm, I'm no Elon Musk. I, I kind of know what you're thinking. But what if I told you that, now I can make some assumptions, based off of, I don't know a lot of you who are on this call, uh, but I can make some assumptions based off of what I know about, um, what I know about Malaysia, having visited there once, twice, I can, I can make some assumptions based off of what I read that nobody, all right, or a lot of people who are listening to me right now are not poor at least not by global standards. So what if I, I told you, or what if I made you realize that you are actually rich by global standards? I mean, the very fact that we are here on Zoom and you manage to log in means you have access to the internet, means you are way off, you're, you're better off than millions of people around the world who still don't have access to the internet in an age where you and I can both admit that not having access to information, that's going to make it really hard to get out of poverty. Um, the fact that we all are dressed, we all look healthy, means we're all better off than millions of people who uh, are not in the same situation. The fact that you, nobody here is worried about where they are going to get water from 
um, tomorrow or even right now, you simply open a tab, it means that you're better off than millions of people around the world. The fact that you can send your kids to school, a good school even, and then after that college, um, means you're better off than several around the world who can't get an education because of poverty or because of social barriers that make it difficult for them to access an education. Um, inequality is something that has a lot to do with you and I today. When you get time, take a look, but a simple Google search, you'll be able to find a website um, titled How Rich Am, am I? Um, and it's done by, um, um, by some economists who um, are encouraging people to give more to those who are in need. Go to this website when you have time. Um, you put in the country that you reside in, you put in your annual income, um, um, your annual household income. So if you and your wife are working, you put in your annual household income, your country so that it adjusts for things like, you know, purchasing parity because one dollar in, um, in a place like uh, Zimbabwe is not going, is going to buy much more than one dollar in a place like France. You put in the number of people that are living in your household and um, it will tell you where you stand um, globally. Um, ranked by income, uh, whether you're low income, uh, poor, uh, middle income, high income. And I'm pretty sure that everybody in this call, on this call, nobody is low income. Um, I mean, the very fact, I think the statistic is about 700 million people in the world today. That, so that's about, that's about 9 to 10% of the world's population. Um, if the world's population is about 7 billion, or seven point something billion. Um, if, if the statistic is about 700 million people in the world today survive on about $2 a day, um, if you can do the math, uh, how much you earn and you divide that by 30, um, you can already see how you are not uh, you are better off than a big chunk of the world's population. That that's just the ten percent. But I can I can guarantee that most of us who are here today are better off than at least forty or fifty percent of the world's population. And I think knowledge of that makes you realize your privilege first of all. And as a Christian, it should make you realize how not doing something when you have been um, given that privilege is preaching a gospel that's got holes in it. It's, it's missing out on what's going on in the world. It's closing your eyes to the injustice that surrounds, that's going on, not just in the world, but even um, uh, uh, near you. There's another uh, calculator by the Pew Research Center. This one will sort of rank you by your region, um, and you can try this one out too. Um, so um, it, it will give you where you rank. Uh, if you're in Southeast Asia, it will give you your ranking in Southeast Asia. But still, um, globally, you will still realize that you're much better than so many other people in the world. And I think us as Christians, um, we shouldn't close ourselves out from this reality. We are living in a world where it's possible to know if you take an Air Force to find out. And I don't think I didn't know about suffering is going to be an excuse when the son of man returns, not in 2021. I am not going to share any pictures of suffering. I make it a point not to share undignified um, images of people in really dire uh, or bad situations of hunger for the simple fact that I believe that we all, if we want to know about what's going on in the world, we have the option to know what's going, around, uh, going on in the world. If we want to know that our neighbor just next door, because poverty is not um, something that uh, happens in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa only, uh, poverty is global. And 
if us not knowing that our neighbor didn't have anything to eat, just the person who stays next door is because we didn't make an effort to find out. Or us not knowing about what's going on just next door in the country next door, just across the border. It's because we don't want to know. When I left college, um, I had big dreams like everybody else who comes out of college and I got back home and I thought, you know, this is it. This is the chance I've been waiting for. I want to be great. Um, I'm going to look for a big job, uh, be the greatest engineer that, I don't know, that Zimbabwe has ever known, work on big projects, build, build big uh, bridges and um, high rise buildings and make a name for myself, uh, move from country to country and uh, spread all of that gladness, that, that greatness around. And, um, and so I started sending out my CVs around, um, looking for a job. Um, responses were slow at first. Um, started talking to people, trying to network, trying to look for that perfect job in which I'll be able to live my perfect engineering dream of being the greatest engineer who ever lived, um, make a lot of money and um, be comfortable. Um, after a while, responses started coming in. Some were, um, some were negative, some were good, some were not what I was looking for. Um, it was not fun. Everybody knows that job hunting is not fun. Eventually something came up and I got accepted to be an intern at a big multinational company, a, a soft drink manufacturer that we all know um, around the world. Um, and I thought, this is it. I'm going to take up that internship. I'm going to work myself up the, up the ladder. I'm going to make sure after that internship, they hire me and become uh, an awesome engineer dealing with real engineering and making an impact somehow in the world and maybe make a few bucks along the way. I got into the um, engineering, um, uh, the big multinational companies, soft drink manufacturing. I was working in the wastewater uh, treatment, making sure that all the water the, the, with chemicals that's coming out of the factory from making all of your soft drinks is cleaned before it goes back out into the river. I was loving it. It was everything that an engineer could dream of. Uh, big engineering machines, just figuring out what uh, what's working and what's not working, dealing with big pumps, figuring out what it felt like, um, what I thought it felt like to deal with big problems. That didn't last very long. It soon became clear, I'm not going to dwell on it, that this company was hesitant to hire me full-time and they sort of kept trying to drag on the internship longer and longer. And so months were passing and they were just not giving me the big final contract that I was waiting for. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to impress them. I still did the best that I could. And from a distance, I was admiring the other engineers who were there full time, looking at the big cars they were driving and thinking to myself, yeah, I want some of that. That was the dream. That's what I wanted. But I think God that thought otherwise. And um, I, around the time I had passed around CVs and around the time I had talked to people, I had met the country director of ADRA in Mozambique and I'd given him my CV and he had looked at it and he was like, yeah, we, would, we might need something like this. We're working on this water project that it involves somebody who has some experience with piping and engineering and pumping. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you and, you know, I forgot about it and um, I still continued to pursue what I thought would be a bigger dream. I moved down south to Pretoria, figuring to myself, you know what, perhaps what I need is a bigger city, bigger city, bigger dreams, perhaps bigger chance of realizing the goal. After a while, they reached out to me and said, hey, you remember that Adra project we talked about? Well, it's about to kick off. Can you get back here and, um, you know, work with us? And I thought, you know what, I'm not doing anything anyway. Um, so let me just put what I'm doing on hold. Um, I'll do this for six months, maybe a year tops. Just see how it is um, and work um, there for a bit. What is ADRA? Um, I was specifically asked to say something about ADRA. ADRA is the Adventist Development and Relief Agency. It is the global humanitarian arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
Adra works to deliver relief um, in disasters around the world and development assistance around the world. Um, Adra serves people around the world, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of political affiliation, and regardless of religious association. Adra will serve based on need, driven by the motto justice, compassion, and love. The purpose statement of Adra is serving humanity so all may live as God intended. Adra has a global reach in 134 countries. I believe offices in about 118 countries. And I just heard this week that two new applications came in for um, offices to be established in two additional countries. Adra works in a lot of areas. Some of the biggest areas that Adra works in are livelihoods and agriculture. Uh, based off of the old adage that teach a man to give a man give a man a fish and feed him for a day, teach a man to fish to fish and feed him for uh, a lifetime. Um, Adra works to improve the skills of people to secure their own um, means of survival. Their own their own develops their skills to uh, secure the basic necessities that they need to live. ADRA works in water and sanitation, which is the area that I'm involved in, um, with the belief that only through um, access to water and sanitation can any of us live a, a dignified life. ADRA works in community health, and ADRA has been on the ground in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, dealing with um, um, global, um, um, dealing with um, public health uh, pandemics like the Ebola outbreak in the DRC. Um, just um, since COVID broke out, ADRA has been working in a lot of countries to make sure that a lot of people around the world have the same um, resources that they need to protect themselves against, um, against uh, infection. ADRA works in disaster relief and ADRA has been on the ground in the aftermath of wars in uh, places like uh, Syria and Yemen. We have some of the largest um, work that we do is in Yemen. Um, ADRA responds to floods in places like the Philippines um, just last year in Mozambique. ADRA is on the ground right now in Haiti, a country that um, faces a lot of misfortunes. I think um, 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 typhoons every two years or so, um, and all that has gone on in Haiti over the last two years. ADRA works um, to improve food security um, just this week and hopefully next week. Um, there, there is what has been described as the most acute drought in the southern part of Madagascar. And just about this week or next week, ADRA will be starting distributions to about 3,200 families and just helping a lot of people who don't have um, anything to eat. ADRA works in the areas of social justice and gender equity. Um, I have already talked about how we as Christians shouldn't have an excuse to live unaware of all of what's going on in, in terms of poverty, in terms of inequality. Um, and I have to admit that I was largely unaware of the scale of the problem of poverty, which is weird because I am from a country that is low income. And you'd think if anybody knows a lot about poverty, it's the person who grew up in a low income country. But if you have traveled, um, not even extensively, but um, if you have traveled to uh, another low income country or if you have traveled to other parts of the world, you'll know that we're living in a world because of inequality. We're living in a world that is now more and more divided along economic lines. And a lot of times it doesn't have to do with geography or race. Um, it is very possible and it happens in a, in, a, in a lot of cases. It is very possible to live in a bubble to be very secluded from the need that's around you. It's become increasingly easy. You could, we could go on a trip to what are described as some of the poorest countries in the world. So um, um, by whatever metric you use, uh, GDP per capita, um, human development index, what can be ranked as in the bottom 10 of the poorest countries. And I've been to some of those places like Mozambique, places like, like, like Haiti, places like Madagascar, places like, um, places like um, Malawi. Um, and you can go on a nice um, game uh, tour, so, uh, a safari tour, 
um, I can, you can call me up and I'll put you in a nice hotel, um, just the same kind of hotel you'd be able to find in a place like, um, in a place like Singapore or in a place like the United Kingdom. Um, you, you will get the kind of treatment that you deserve because of your class. That's the kind of world that we're living in. Um, and it, it's become increasingly easy to live in a bubble and not know what's going on just next door or just in, in the country, just, just next to you. You, you, could, you could live your entire life. And what happens is because you're middle income, your kids will go to a middle income school, you'll go to a middle income church, your friends are middle income, you don't know what's happening to the people that are, um, uh, that are more vulnerable. Um, by no standard were my parents rich, um, by no stretch of the imagination. Um, but I have to realize my privilege, as is with anybody or most people who are listening to this call, who are listening um, on, um, I have to admit that in, in relation, by, by global standards, I lived a very privileged life. Uh, the fact that I don't remember ever going to bed hungry. I don't ever remember my mom going, sorry, guys, there's just no food today. Um, I, I don't ever remember us not having water to drink. Um, that, that's the kind of privilege that I'm talking, talking about. Um, and so what's happening is that a lot of Christians are living in this bubble. We, we hang around with the people that um, are within um, the same income bracket, more or less, as ourselves. And it becomes easy to, to ignore or not see what's going on um, to those who are around us. For example, the thing that I deal with every day, inadequate access to water. This is a photo that was taken by my boss. And it's one of the first photos that I saw of the situation in Mukuba, that's in central Mozambique, even before I got there. Um, and it's a man just fetching water, digging a, a hole in the ground to fetch water. Um, and they'll find a way to let it sit for a while so that they can drink that after a while. And th this, this is not just a problem that's um, isolated um, to central Mozambique. It's not a problem that's isolated to sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's a global problem that has yet to be solved. Um, the fact that there are still a lot of people that are living with less than 15, 15 liters of water every day. So the standard that a lot of humanitarian workers use so like when ADRA realizes that there's a problem somewhere, usually the scale of the problem is just so big and you can't deal with it. You, there's no way in a short space of time, say after a disaster or during a drought, to get water to everyone. So usually the standard that's used globally uh, by humanitarian workers is a minimum of 15 liters per person per day. So even when we get to places to set up water systems, we, we have it in our mind that at least let's give them 15 liters per person per day. Now, think about that. That's, that's when things are now good. That's, that's when ADRA gets there and we, we, we've done the best that we can for the time. That means before we even get there, people are living on less than 15 liters per person per day. Now, try it one day. I have tried it just for fun, um, which speaks to my privilege because I have to do it because I just want to try it out. But try living on 15 liters per person per day. Um, <clears throat> this is about five liters. So if you have about three of those, try spending a day with just three of those um, to see how millions of people around the world are getting by. Um, wake up in the morning. Um, you might not be able to bath because you'll realize that it's not much. If you bath, you might take up all of it. You might be able to wash your face. Um, if you're in a hot place like Malaysia, you might end up having to drink a lot of it. Um, that's the same amount of water that you're going to use for any kind of cooking that you're going to do. Um, when you go to the toilet, and a lot of people who live in houses with piped water and plumbing, you, you don't really get to realize how much water you're using. So on average, I know this because, you know, they teach us this in school. Most houses that have piped water will use something like 150 liters per person per day. Um, and 50 liters of it is just to carry your waste away. So 
Um, 50 liters is just at your disposal. Just, and then the rest we, we use to just, you know, water our lawn, just making sure we have nice green grass outside. Um, and yet um, there, there's the need is just so great. And so I, because I never had to walk in the morning to fetch my own water before school, I now had to live in this place where even at the little apartment that I was staying in, water was a problem. And so the, for the first time in my life, I had to deal with um, scar water scarcity at a very personal level. Um, where sometimes my water just wouldn't come out, which is something that happens a lot in a place, in places even in urban Zimbabwe. Um, and for the first time in my life, I had to uh, deal with not having any other places to get water. But luckily for me, because I had a bit of money, you can always go to the store and buy a bottle of water to drink. But then you're face to face with the reality of how a lot of people in the world are living. And I challenge you as Christians to take an effort to find out how other people around you are living and to burst the bubble that you're living in and to realize that the world is bigger than the community that you live in and to realize, to take an effort to find out how the person who lives in the same, the old lady who's in your apartment, um, did she eat yesterday? Um, not saying I didn't know is not going to be able to cut it when Jesus comes again. And the questions that he's going to ask are, I was hungry. What did you do about it? Um, I, I, was, I was thirsty. What did you do about it? I was in prison. Did you visit me? I was um, a stranger. And I think in 2021, a stranger would read, I was an immigrant. I was I was an immigrant from, if we're in Malaysia, I was an immigrant from, say, Bangladesh. What did you do about it? Did you spend all of your time complaining about how the immigrants are stealing our jobs and um, crime rates are rising? When he asks, I was a stranger, what are you going to say about the time you heard about the, the refugees from um, um Burma, Myanmar, were you part of the people as a Christian community, were you part of the people who were making an effort to talk to your governments to say, hey, we have to let these people in. Um, nobody is an immigrant or a refugee because they want to. Um, when, when Jesus comes back and he's asking all of these questions, because those are the questions that he's going to ask. You can find that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. Those are the questions that, that Jesus is going to ask when he, when he comes back. I think at least in my Bible, the chapter is actually titled, and your version might say something different. It's titled The Final Judgment. And it's, it talks about how when the Son of Man comes back and his king with the angels are with him and is sitting on the throne and is going to say, I was hungry. What did you do about it? Um, and as Christians, we need to start asking ourselves, are we going to be able to give good answers to those questions? A lot of the solutions that Adra was giving, I'm really racing against time. A lot of the solutions that Adra was giving um, for water supply had to do with um, hand pump, manual pumps. And um, if you have seen hand pumps, someone like Robert would be able to, you might have seen hand pumps in places like, like India, um, you have to physically exert force and the water comes out um, from deep in the ground. Um, you, and a lot of times you don't have a lot of them in the community, just a few of them. So people have to line up in some places. I, I've seen people spending um, hours, uh, women um, lining up from as early as five in the morning to get water. Um, kids um, being late to school, because, you know, first they have to go, go and get water, then they come back home. Just the walk to the hand pump is, is a journey that takes maybe an hour. You get back, you bath, and then you get to school. By the time you get to school, the, the child is tired. There's no way they are going to be able to learn because they are now tired. And then that cycle of poverty perpetuates itself because uh, it's got, there's, there's so many dimensions to poverty. And then now because um, you, you don't have a good education, it's just harder to get your daughter out of that cycle. Your daughter is also going back to that same well. These are the kinds of questions, the kinds of problems that um, Adra had been dealing with for a long time. And um, they had this idea to sort of 
uh, build a lot of water systems in, in Mukuba, but to build on, you know, these boreholes, instead of having this manual thing to sort of um, make something that it taps and um, a little structure where people wouldn't have to use all of um, their force to get water out of the ground. Um, and so by the time I joined the kind of work that I early on got involved in, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Oops. So I got into this job where um, instead of doing as much as I thought I'd be doing in my profession, I found myself doing what I thought was less. Instead of working on really big high rise building, I found myself working on small little things. But I found out that it's sometimes possible to do more by doing less. Um, we started working on really amazing designs that my boss had started working on way before I even got there. Um, we started making plans of what this idea would look like, generating computer models of what this dream would look like, some better way of getting more water to more people at the same time. We were thinking of using solar to, uh, to harness the, the power of solar to, to pump water to tanks and then get it to flow to even nearby clinics, nearby um, schools and health facilities and um, making sure that people spend less time fetching water. We started work, um, some of perhaps the most fascinating uh, construction projects that I've worked on, really small things, but really the, the feeling of um, this is something that is helping a lot of people is one that stays with you. Um, the, we call them water kiosks. We're finally completed. Um, we tried a, a few of them in, in Mukuba and um, um, the dream became a reality. This next video and, you know, for this presentation, I was just trying to get a, a lot of videos from different places about the work that um, we do with ADRA from different places. And some of some of them were made for different occasions. This next one was made for children. I'm sorry about that. Um, just to confirm also, are there any glitches in the video as I played? Robert? It's all good. All right, cool. Tino is not just our local guide. He is also an engineer who solves water problems in places just like Makuba. Take it away, Tino. Hey kids, it's me, your friend Tino from Mozambique. I'm here at the Adra Water Kiosk in Makuba, a small town with a big need for clean water. Oh, 
for water because it's taken from really deep in the ground. It's generally clean. It has passed through layers of rock, allowing it to have been cleaned through filtration through layers of rock. Before it served to the communities, we treat it with chlorine, such that before the people that get to the kiosk get their water, they are getting clean, treated water. But thanks to the Adra water kiosk, the people of Mukuba have clean water to drink all year round. In my family, there are a lot of chores. Mine is to fetch the water. It really is a difficult chore because the river is far away and the container is heavy. Plus, we use a lot of water at my house, so I have to go to the river many times. But I never complain. Even when I would rather go to play with my friends, I still do my chore. Adra built the water kiosk just a few blocks from my house. I was really happy. My chore is so much easier now. I don't have to walk all the way down to the muddy riverbank to fetch dirty water anymore. I can walk just a few minutes to get cold, clean water for my family. Now I have time to do everything I want. I can help my family and play with my friends. After a long day of playing, we always know where to go for a drink of good water. I think that's a pretty good reason to celebrate. Adra is also doing a lot of um, fascinating water um, supply work in places like Zimbabwe, again, using the magic of solar to pump water from deep in the ground. Um, I was in a place in um, central Zimbabwe, um, I want to say, in Gokwe, um, west Zimbabwe, um, just a few months ago. And I remember talking to a school head who had just uh, had water connected to his school by um, one of um, by some of the work that we're doing out there, and him talking about how um, just having water at their school enrollment, the number of students who are now coming to his school had gone up in just a few weeks, just because his was now the school that had running water. So talking about how um, solving one problem. Um, it can be a solution to a lot more of the problems that a lot of people in the world are facing. One of the most fascinating places where Adra does work is in Yemen. Um, Yemen has been described as the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, just what's going there, what's going on there is just really de devastating. We have an amazing team in Yemen. Um, I think the, the most number of engineers that I have seen working um, together on an Adra project are in Yemen. Um, coming up with really fascinating ways to get water to people. This video has really poor sound and it is mostly in Arabic, but um, you, you you get to see some of the work that um, Adra is doing out there. عانى أهالي مدينة لحج العديد من الأزمات وعلى وجه الخصوص قرية الثعلب فقد عانت من شحة المياه في بادرة من أيادي الخير قامت منظمة أدرا ببناء خزان ماء استراتيجي لتلبية متطلبات 
Okay, I'll perhaps uh, skip over that one. But um, you have seen a bit of it. Oh, there goes some English. ...and rehabilitation of water infrastructure, oriented and guided by its uh, technical advisors and engineers, in partnership with water and sanitation cooperation. The project provided clean water for more than 5,000 of affected people who suffered from the shortage of water and malnutrition. نحن نتقدم بالشكر الجزيل لمنظمة الدولة التي تدخلت في هذه المنطقة التي تحتوي على ما يقارب 700 أسرة وسكانها يتجاوز 5000 نسمة الناس كانوا في البداية يعني الأمانة كان الناس الأطفال بدل مثلا ما يصرع يقوم الصباح يروح للمدرسة يروح يجيب ماء Some of um... Um, some of the other fascinating work that ADRA has been doing in water is in, uh, is in Haiti, a country that um, if you've uh, seen the news in the past couple of weeks or months, you, you know that ADRA, uh, that Haiti has, um, has experienced disaster after disaster. Um, there was the earthquake just recently, which was followed up by some flooding. Um, and then there's just the political unrest that's going on. Um, in the city where we um, where the earthquake occurred in Lakai, um, it's um, we we have some water supply activities going on there, um, and Adra is also serving people in an urban context this time where a lot of houses just don't have a pipe supply uh, for water that's coming into their homes. Um, I'm being tempted to skip over this slide, but uh, ba basically um, we know the story of Dorcas um, in the book of Acts. Um, she went about performing acts of kindness, um, making clothes for um, the, the widows and the orphans. And one day she died and oh man, everybody cried. Um, the widows were, you know, crying about who, now who's going to make clothes for us. And um, they go up to Peter and Peter ends up raising Dorcas from the dead. And I believe that Dorcas wasn't raised um, just because so that she could continue her life. She was raised because people needed her. She was raised back to life because um, because of, of the church's, for the ch church's sake, for the sake of the widow, for the, for the sake of the orphan. And I, I often ask myself if the church, God's church, if Lighthouse Church, if the Adventist church was to disappear, just poof, um, how many widows would be crying and how many orphans would be crying? How many um, poor people would be going, oh man, what's going to happen now? We, we don't have the Adventist church now. Um, uh, what, what's going to happen um, now that uh, Pastor Vincent is dead? Um, to leave the world a better place, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, that is to have succeeded. The last thing that I'm going to share with you is a poem by John Newton. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard the, the name John Newton before. If the first thing that you thought about was uh, amazing grace, you're correct. If the First thing that you thought about was uh, gravity. Yeah, wrong. Just hit yourself and say bad. <laughs> uh, that's Isaac Newton. Um, John Newton was the songwriter now most famous for Amazing Grace. And this is perhaps one of the most um, lovely poems I've ever read. Um, I think I first stumbled upon it three years ago. Our pleasure and our duty, though once opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. I'll just repeat that again because it's just so loaded and I love it so much. Our pleasure and our duty, though once opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, 
are joined to part no more. Let me break that down a little. Here's what John Newton is saying. On one hand, you have your pleasure, the things that you enjoy doing, the things that you would do even if nobody asked you to do, the things that you would do even if you, nobody paid you to do it. You could do it 24 hours a day. So think of, I, I don't know, watching soccer. Um, think of watching movies. Um, think of... Um, think of Think of, think of sleeping. I love sleeping too. Um, think of eating, just good food, your pleasure, the things that you love, playing FIFA, the things that you love. Um, and then on the other hand, you have your duty, <laughs> the, things that you, the things that you do because you just have to do them. Um, the things that you do because, oh, well, it's your duty. So if you're a father um, going on a school run, picking your kids from school, might not exactly be fun, but you have to do it. It's your duty as a father. Um, paying taxes, that's always a good one. You have to do it. It's your duty as a citizen and you might go to jail. Um, going to church, if you're a Christian, it might feel like, oh, I have to, I'll just go, it's my Christian duty. Or returning tithe. Things that you do, not because you exactly like them, but you sort of just do them because, oh man, oh well, duty. So John Newton says, on one hand, you have your pleasure. And then on the other hand, you have your duty. And there's this really sad thing that happens as a Christian. Um, sometimes you find out that your pleasures, the things that you do because um, they just bring you pleasure, a lot of times they are not in accordance with God's will. So you find out that the things that you enjoy doing or the, the, the music that you enjoy listening to is contrary to what God would want you listening to, or the things that you set your eyes on are, are things that, you know, if Jesus walked in the room, you wouldn't be able to continue watching that. Um, or you, you find that sometimes your pleasures, the things that make you happy, make God sad. And then on the other hand, the things that are your duty as your Christian, John Newton says, sometimes you find them boring. I've been talking about service. And it's very possible that when you think about service, it just feels like something that you have to do because it's your duty. You don't quite enjoy it. And John Newton says, before you really have a deep relationship with God, he uses the words, before you see the beauty of Christ, before you have that close um, communion with him, your pleasure and your duty are divorced. The things that you love to do, God doesn't like them. The things that you have to do, you don't find them fun. But something amazing happens when you develop your relationship with Christ. Something amazing happens when you nurture your relationship with Christ, when you um, see the beauty of Christ. All of a sudden, your pleasure, the things that you like to do, all of a sudden, those things are now in accordance with God's will. And all of a sudden, your duties, the things that you do because you're a Christian, you start finding those things fun. So all of a sudden, when they say, hey, let's go to church, you're like, yes, let's do this. And all of a sudden, when, um, when they say, hey, let's go and serve the poor or let's, let's, let's um, help out um, those who are less fortunate, you find pleasure out of it. And he says, once you see the beauty of Christ, your pleasure and your duty are joined to part no more. I just want to pray right now for somebody who's been listening, um, who wants to pray um, and ask God to start finding joy in service. Someone who's saying, you know, I haven't really done a lot for you. And honestly, I have closed my eyes to the need and poverty and injustice that's around, that's around me. But I now realize that um, as a Christian, I, my heart needs to start getting broken by the things that break your heart. Um, and um, I want to uh, start finding joy in serving you. Um, if you want to join me in that prayer, please bow your heads and we'll pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you've given us to speak. It has been long, I know, but uh, there was just so much that I thought was um, important to share. I hope that something that was said this um, evening or afternoon made an impact in someone's life, 
Help us, Lord, to look for ways to serve you better. Um, open our eyes to the need, the injustice, the poverty around us. Help us to realize that we are called to serve you, um, regardless of what our day job is. Help us to find ways to serve you in the jobs that we have. Um, we realize that service doesn't always mean going to some corner of the world. Um, help us open our eyes to the need that's around us and near us. And also open our eyes to help us to even help those who are in far off places. And if we are in a job or in a profession where we're finding it hard to answer the question, am I serving God? Help us, Lord, as we try to look for other ways, even to move to a profession in which we can serve you better. And so move our hearts, stir our hearts, and give us no rest until we are satisfied and convinced that we are doing something for you um, and that we're not just living in a bubble. Um, help us and um, guide us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.